Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. Welcome to The How of Business. This is Henry Lopez, and my guest today is Mike McFall. Mike, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Henry. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Mike is back on the show. He's previously on episode 433 of The How of Business podcast. He's back with me today to share further insights from his experience as a very successful entrepreneur, but specifically on how to grow a small business. So we're going to chat about his latest book, which helps people go from, as he describes, the chaos that often we find ourselves in, in a small business to a calm business that is sustainable long-term. So that's where we're going to explore his insights on that, especially as he has shared in his new book, Grow. To receive more information about the Howa business, including links to the show notes page for this episode, and how you can continue to support my show and receive exclusive content and discounts through a Patreon membership, just visit thehowabusiness.com. So Mike McFall is the co-founder and co-CEO of Big B Coffee. Big B Coffee is one of the fastest growing coffee franchises in the United States. And for Mike, despite not having an MBA or being a workaholic, Mike has built his career through hard work and real world experiences. He prioritizes people and purpose over business target and fancy presentations, and his pragmatic solutions are forged from this philosophy. Mike understands that people are the most important ingredient to any successful enterprise, and he helps employees create a purpose-driven business that will transform the world and improve people's lives. Mike is the author, as I mentioned previously, and we chatted about the book Grind, which he released back in 2019 when he was on episode 433 of the podcast. And today we're going to talk about his latest book, Grow, Take Your Business from Chaos to Calm. This is the, These two are the first two books in a three-book series that uh, Mike has been working on, and they offer practical advice for entrepreneurs, small business owners like us, looking to turn their business concepts into successful ventures, but now beyond that, how to grow that business. Mike is also a public speaker, and he teaches a class on entrepreneurialism at the University of Michigan Center for Entrepreneurship. And in his free time, Mike plays and coaches hockey and has a moonshot, so a moonshot goal to one day own the Detroit Red Wings. Mike lives in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So once again, Mike, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate it. Yeah, looking forward to this conversation. We had such a great conversation the first time around. And if you're interested, very interesting journey, how Mike got to where he is today, that inspirational story. We chatted about that in episode 433 of the How a Business podcast. So go back and listen to that if you haven't already or if it's been a while, because on this one, we're going to get right into it, Mike. I want to get right into the book, which again is entitled Grow, Take Your Business from Chaos to Calm. The question I thought we would start with, which I always ask about books, is why did you write it and who is it for? Well, I I wrote the book as part of the the series, but but this particular book is written to talk about the transition of going from a, a bootstrapping entrepreneur to an effective leader and then ev eventually to irrelevance. And so it's this transition and it's a transition that most entrepreneurs struggle with. And the reason they struggle with it is that so much of what makes you strong as an entrepreneur also gets in your way as a leader. And so it's really about the transition. And I aspire to uh, have people read the book and hopefully walk away with some practical things that they can be doing in order to help them make that transition. Mm -hmm. And we, we chat a little bit about this in our last conversation, but I, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, often what gets us to this point as, as first time business owners, as entrepreneurs, or even if we've been at it for a while is that attitude of I'll do it. I'll get it done. I'll just be the one that gets it done, right? If it, if, it, if it needs to be done, I'll do it myself. And that doesn't help us become leaders, right? 
Right. And, and, you know, you hear that all the time, you know, you hear that, you know, it's just, it's just easier if I go ahead and do it myself, right. I'll do it properly. I'll do it better. I'll do it more efficiently. I'll do it more effectively. And you know what, that might be true in that given circumstance, but at the end of the day, if you're the one that always has to be the one, you know, diving in and doing it, that that's not something that you can scale. That's not, it's not healthy for your team. You're not growing your people. You're not developing your team and your people. And so really at the end of the day, it's, it becomes not about you doing it, but you facilitating an environment where other people are doing it as well or better than you could do it. Yeah, absolutely. And the point about scaling is, is probably the, the key point besides wanting to build leaders. It, you just can't grow very large beyond yourself or beyond a business that depends entirely on you if if everything has to be done by you or you have to approve everything or you know it has to have your fingerprints on everything it just doesn't scale um yeah yeah it's like it, i mean it's very it's very simple math right yeah okay grind was more about the startup right and and now this book tell me a little bit more how how it's next in this series now it's about taking that business to the next level and becoming an effective leader right well yeah grind takes you from the moment you commit to a new business to doing it through to your first days of positive cash flow and it tries to capture the ethos of that entrepreneurial moment in startup so but then you get to the moment when you are, you now have a, what I would consider to be a viable business, you're cash flowing and you're in that bootstrapping entrepreneurial phase. Mm -hmm. Phase that, and, and often maybe perhaps like as you pointed out, stuck in that mindset, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the word grow is a little bit of a double entendre. So of course we want to grow the business, mm -hmm. but how we grow the business, Henry is, by growing ourselves as right, leaders, right? We need to evolve. We need to get better, uh, and we need to become the leader that our organization needs us to be, in order to actually grow the business. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you know, the subtitle is your business. Take your business from chaos to calm. How do you define calm as it relates to a business? What what does that look like typically? Well, you as the leader, your your phone isn't ringing anymore. Uh, you are working on projects that are strategic in nature, meaning they're, you know, three to five to seven years out. Uh, you are not dealing with the fire of the day. You don't even know that the fire of the day is occurring. And, and so you get to spend your time focused on uh, the future and what the business needs to be in three to five to seven years. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's calm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. But what, we're going to talk about some of these, but what do you, what have you observed or, or we touched on already, you know, that, that lack of being able to let go, that inability to, to delegate. Uh, what are some of the other causes that you see early on in that transition that create that chaos of a small business? What, what else leads to this in your observation? Well, you know, I think first we have to give up the notion that we're the smartest person in the room. And because we're not, and when you're developing a team, you have to put people in the positions, uh, areas of responsibility where they're better at, at that particular job than you are. And then you have to believe in them and let them work. Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is most of us as entrepreneurs, especially in the early stages of the development business, we believe we're the smartest person in the room. Right. And, and so what happens, and then the other, the other thing that's oftentimes difficult is you, you put people uh, in positions of leadership who, you know, you promote from within and, but then the, the end result of that is that that person isn't actually a leader of that world, of their world. They're just a surrogate for you. And you're still the one making all the decisions and calling all the shots. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, those two things, uh, I think, get in the way of, of developing people and developing the team so that the team is actually making the decisions and, and managing the business and so on. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you touched on this already, but one of the things you talk about is that the definition of sustainable business is one in which you become irrelevant. That's that's a tough one for, I think, any entrepreneur to accept with our egos that I'm going to be irrelevant to the business. But tell me about why you specifically word it that way. Well, if your business is going to be sustainable, at the end of the day, you have to be irrelevant and the team has to be managing, leading the business and thriving. And so I word irrelevance is that you really, you could get run over by a bus tomorrow and the business would continue to thrive. And, and isn't that what, I mean, ultimately I think that's what we all want, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very, very difficult transition. It so, is, yeah. yeah. So many of us have our, you know, um, our worth wrapped up in the fact that we're the leader of this enterprise. Exactly. Of this it, become, enterprise. it becomes our identity in a lot of cases, right? Yeah. And, 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 you know, so when you, when, and oftentimes these are very successful enterprises, these are, you know, you have a lot of uh, credibility in the world because you did that. Mm -hmm. And but the problem is, is if you can't give up uh, the, the, the reins and, and holding the reins super tightly uh, when you're gone, that business is not going to continue to thrive. Right. Right. And if I try, if I, if I think I'm going to exit some other way while I'm still alive, you know, sell it or whatever, that's going to create a challenge as well. And it comes back to the scalability issue. I'm only going to grow so far. Right. Well, and also though, you know, I believe that if I do want to sell it and I have a super powerful leadership team in place and that, I want to sell it and I want to exit that that makes my company more valuable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I've already got that team in place that they, they can take forward. It's not dependent on me being the rainmaker or whatever it is that's so that I've made myself so uh, uh, irreplaceable in the business that that is one of the biggest things that people look at as to whether a business is valuable or not to, to consider purchasing, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's a, you know, that is something that we need to be thinking about as leaders, right? We need to be thinking about, you know, the value of the company. A big part of that is, is, is it sustainable? And the only way it's sustainable is if it can, if it can thrive moving forward without you. Yeah. Um, I think one of the challenges there as, as we're making this transition is when, when do we, when, how do we convince ourselves or tell ourselves, that, okay, the business is ready. It doesn't require you to do everything anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to be the engine behind all of this. It's time to develop your team. Um, what do I look for? What do you look for to tell me, okay, it's, it's time to move away from the bootstrapping mode into developing leaders. Well, you know, I think the first thing to understand is that it's not a straight line path. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> you know, point. it is, it, it, it's windy. You go mm -hmm. backwards at times you, you know, and, and so like I talk about in the book that you, you, know, you may have somebody who's in a leadership role who you've depended on for a long time. They're, they're incredibly solid. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you know, four out of their seven uh, uh, people on their team resign. And it's like, whoa, what you, and all of a sudden that team needs your attention and that leader needs your attention. You know, they may have been for you on automatic pilot for three, five years, but then all of a sudden it's like, boom. And then you've got to step back in and, and bring leadership to that particular moment in time. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really about knowing. And one of the key premises of the book is knowing who you need to be for your team. And then for each individual on your team, I see to, today, it might be about empathy. It might be, you know, you might have to spend, you know, time with somebody because they had a death in the family or, you know, whatever. But then an hour later, you might be in front of uh, another group that, you know, missed some really important target. And, and at that moment, you might need to be red in the face, pissed, you know, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and like, so, so that's leadership though. That's the essence of leadership is who do you need to be at this particular moment in time? And it takes years to grow and develop and build the team and, and you'll, you'll move forward and you'll move back. And, but at the end of the day, it's, we've been at it for 27 years. 
And so at the end of the day, you want to have the team developed in such a way that it takes care of itself. Yeah. And that, you know, so it, it just starts uh, at the beginning uh, by, you know, putting people in leadership roles and then supporting them how they need to be supported. Yeah. I think that one of the things I take from that perspective, Mike, in particular is I, I think that the, the fact that you said it's not a straight road, it's not a straight path helps us to not get frustrated when we do have to take that step back or we do have to inject ourselves again or get more into the day-to-day in that particular part of the business to not look at it as, well, see, this will never work or I'm going to give up on this. I This will, won't work if unless I'm the one that's doing it. We, we can't let that discourage us from continuing to build uh, this leadership within our business, right? Well, exactly. And, you know, the the piece of that that's important is that when you do step back into a role or you engage, you know, maybe at a, at a more micro level, you approach that from the perspective of coaching and teaching. Not that, not that it's, you know, you're, you're, you're the only one that can do it, or you have to, you know, step back in and, in, in, being cynical about that, but that's a moment when you can teach and coach, yeah. right? Mentor. And that's the perspective you have to take in those moments is that you're mentoring and you're coaching your leaders. Is that part of how you, as you talk about cultivate a work environment that encourages people to thrive? Is that part of it? How we accomplish that helping people thrive within the organization? Yeah, I think so. Um, it's, but, but that has, less to do with your engagement one-on-one with a leader and more to do with facilitating an environment Mm -hmm. within the team that allows each team member to thrive in their own way. And ultimately at the end of the day, the team is supporting each individual. Got it. So this, this is partly what I might call culture as well. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And and my the way I've always looked at it as especially as you grow to that next level, as as the leader, that's one of my primary responsibilities is to nurture and foster that culture, right? You are responsible for the culture, yes. And and you know, at the end of the day, you, you hopefully will have built such a strong culture that it will live in perpetuity. But mm-hmm. as you're going through this really incredibly long and arduous transition. Your job in that transition is to protect the culture of the organization. Right, right. Okay, the other topic I wanted to jump to that you talk about in the book is the role that trust and integrity play in this uh, in this transition to becoming a leader, to effectively leading the business and the company. So let's talk about that trust and integrity and how that plays a role. Give me some of your thoughts there, if you would, Mike. Well, I think that the, one of the primary transitions in thinking um, that I want to, you know, that I want to occur when somebody reads my book is that you as the leader, you have to earn the right to lead. And people will step into your organization, maybe you bring in somebody in from the outside, and they show up and they don't automatically allow you to lead them. You have to earn that right. And you earn that right through building trust with them, supporting them, and being a person of integrity. And if you and if you step outside of integrity, you are losing your ability to lead. And so that's what integrity does, is when somebody knows that they can depend on you, they know that you're there for them. They know that you are supporting them and nurturing them and bringing them the things that they need to grow. And you live with an integrity within that. Then you have the ability and you've earned the right to lead them. But it starts with you earning that right to lead them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is Henry Lopez with a brief break from this episode to share a special offer from our new show sponsor, Zinch. Zinch has been providing fast and convenient financing solutions for small business owners since 2004. Unexpected expenses can pop up anytime in a small business. 
equipment breakdowns, license and permit fees, customer payment delays, and many other unexpected expenses for which you may not have the cash on hand to cover. And if you don't address this cash flow issue quickly, it could make or break your business. As I have shared many times on this podcast, running out of cash is one of the top reasons businesses can fail. If you require a loan to cover these unexpected expenses, the traditional loan process is too slow to be of any help. This is where Zinch comes in as the financing solution you need. Zinch is a direct lender that makes financing fast, simple, and built around your needs. If you're generating over 10,000 in monthly revenues and have been in business for over six months, Zinch can fund up to $250,000 in less than two days. The process is simple and quick. You answer some basic questions about your business and may receive a pre-qualified offer in less than five minutes without affecting your credit. Once approved, one of Zinch's loan advisors will review the lending options with you and help you choose the best one for your business. After signing your loan documents securely online, you'll receive funds in your bank account within 24 hours. I encourage you to see how much financing you can get with Zinch. And right now, Zinch is waiving the application fee for my listeners. That's a $250 value. So just visit financingthatworks.com. That's financingthatworks.com to learn more about Zinch. Loans are made or arranged pursuant to a California finance lender's law license. The the way that I've seen that manifest and the way that I've tried to develop that, and I'm curious as to your thoughts, in part is by uh, keeping your promises, st- sticking to your commitments. And of course, that means you can't overpromise. You got to be real and, and uh, as honest as possible with your team members. Uh, there's not, we can't always tell them everything about what's going on in the business at the highest levels, but the, the, the more that you are transparent there and the more that you follow through on promises that you make, those are part of the things that people look for to determine that integrity. Do you agree with that, Mike? Oh, absolutely. You know, doing, doing what you say you're going to do is, is, you know, it's just fundamental, but you know, there's, there's little moments too. And I'll just tell a quick story. And and I hope this relates. I was at home and I had a zoom call and, you know, I was in the kitchen doing something with my oldest son. And I was like, Oh, you know, I'm going to be late for this call. I got to go. I got to get over to, to my computer. And 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 he said something to the effect of, "Well, aren't you the boss? Like, can't mm. I mean, is it, you know?" And I and I said, "It's even more important for me to be on time, yes, because I'm the boss, yes. <laughs> right?" And and like that's such a simple little thing, but you know, I'll show up to meetings. I was in a I was in a Zoom call yesterday, and I was with another organization, and the leader of that organization showed up like seven minutes late. Yeah, and it's just disrespectful. It you is. know, and, and, and so to me, that's outside of integrity and, right. and, you know, and so like, to me, you know, I don't think my son understood it at that moment. Hopefully someday he will, <laughs> but, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you mentioned transparency and I, I am an absolute advocate of full transparency. And, you know, the, the, the idea there is, is there is it's transparency to me is black and white. You're either transparent you're either fully transparent or you're not. And if you commit to be fully, fully transparent, you're, you're unloading a lot of responsibility on the people on your team. And I love that. And so I think that we as leaders should be fully transparent. We should bring all of our people into the stuff that we're dealing with day in and day out. And when we do, they begin to respect the complexity of the role, the complexity of the things we have going on, and you're building rapport, you're building respect because you're 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 respecting them by trusting them enough to share right. everything with them. All right, let me dive into that because this is really uh, interesting to me. Transparency. A uh, couple of questions. First is, is it different what I divulge though, depending on where they are in the organization? In other words, my leadership team. I'm going to be at a different level of transparency than I might be with my line level employees. Is, is that how you look at it or what are your thoughts there? No, I don't, I don't believe that. So transparency Uh, all the way through 
And where do I then where do I draw the line on what I share and what I don't share? What are your thoughts there, especially as it relates to financials, Mike? Well, so I'm an advocate of full transparency on financials. Everybody in my company knows how much I make each year. They know how much I distribute to myself. Uh, they know the bonuses that I cut myself. Uh, they know every 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 dollar that every other team gets. Um, I'm an advocate and I am not winning uh, this argument internally at the moment, but I am an advocate that everybody in the organization should know exactly what everybody else makes. Hmm. Because what's, what's the, what's the friction? That's just not the way it's usually done. Is that, is that the pushback uh, internally? I'm curious. Well, one of the pushbacks internally is that you open yourself up to liability. I see. You know, and that you have to be careful that, you know, maybe you have pay discrepancies and and that there could be liability there. But my point is, is, mm. yeah, let's but let's if there let's is fix a pay that. Discrepancy, <laughs> ex- <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Let's have that conversation. And then, you know what, you might have to have a conversation with somebody that says, I'm sorry, this is what we think you and this role should be paid. And if you think that that you're worth more than that, more power to you. Right. And go go find the job out there in the world that's going to pay you that. But inside of our organization, this is what we can pay you and this is what we think you're worth. Right. So but but, you know, I I just transparency is something that I think keeps everyone honest, myself included. And so that is uh, something, you know, if you share with a, a, you know, let's say an entry level employee some of the big strategic initiatives and why they're important. They may not be able to grasp everything, but just by sharing that with them, you're showing them respect. Absolutely. And, I agree with you there. There's no doubt. And they get to ask the hard question. You know, they get to ask that question that that maybe everybody else, <laughs> everybody else wants to ask too, but because they're so junior, they, they're free to ask it because they're not supposed to know, you know, type thing. How do I handle then if I do if I do become that transparent if I'm going through tough financial times in the business does that not create unnecessary stress in the team Well they all know it's there anyway so you know the, the, you know I would say uh, don't don't ever kid yourself that they don't know because I believe they know and That's fair it's like kids and, know when their parents aren't getting along right no matter how yeah. much you try to keep it from them Yeah. And so like, I'll take COVID, you know, COVID, we went into COVID and there was a moment when, you know, we weren't sure and revenue was absolutely plummeting. And, uh, and so, you know, we just, we had a very, I mean, very real conversation with our entire group. You know, we, we opted to, to lay off, uh, was it about 65% of our employees? Wow. And we, we asked, let's see, I, I'm not gonna remember the exact percentages, but you know, the the more entry level people, we asked them to take a 20% pay cut. Our senior people took a 50% pay cut, and then my partner and I took an 80% pay cut. And and you know, that was a hard conversation to have. I didn't want to have it. Um, but the fact of the matter was is you know, we were we were flat out going into survival mode there. Yeah. And you know, our our position on it was, and you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we kept everyone employed. And and it was, you know, our thinking at that moment is, could we have done that? We could have. But we also, it wasn't going to take that long before we depleted our resources. Mm-hmm. And then we were all going to be in trouble. Right, right. And so we did, we took that action. Um, people understood, uh, you know, obviously people weren't happy about it. And we said, we will hire you back as quickly as we possibly can. And then by a lot of good fortune, uh, you know, our business, we were, we were in a, in a um, difficult situation for about four to five weeks is all. Um, the governor of Michigan declared us an essential business. Uh, mm-hmm. We were able to stay open. And then we started to, you know, we started to grow again and we brought everybody back instantly. You know, as quickly which, as which, which again, speaks to integrity, right? You did what you said you were going to do. Yes. You were, you were transparent as to why you decided to do this for the, for the benefit of the business at a, at a, at an overall. And then you kept your promise about hiring them back as best you could. Yeah. And we were really clear and transparent about how difficult the situation was. 
Very good. Great insights. All right. I want to switch to then another word, vulnerability. And I want to explore that for a moment because I think that that is also hard for us as um, business owners, as entrepreneurs, uh, first of all, to admit that we don't know the answer to something or that we are challenged with a particular thing. We believe, and I think, I don't know, maybe we've been indoctrinated into believe that we have to at least be perceived as knowing it all and having all the answers. So tell me about that and that role and how how do you look at being vulnerable? That I'm, I'm looking at it from that perspective of vulnerability. Do you, what are your no, thoughts I love, there? I, yeah. I love that perspective because that's a sickness. Yeah, <laughs> that is a sickness. Meaning, yes, I agree with you that that we believe that we have to have all the answers. That that we believe we you know need to present ourselves as you know the perfect leader. Uh, we need to be in control at all times. You know, one of the most powerful things that you can do as a leader is make a mistake, admit that mistake, and then apologize for it. Yeah, I agreed. We all make mistakes. You're, you're modeling that, if nothing else, right, for the and, rest of the team. Yeah, and then that's that's vulnerable. That is, that's just, that's just real. You know, I mean, I make mistakes all the time. I, yesterday, (laughs) yesterday, I had a conversation with somebody and I, you know, I realized and I went and I checked my North with somebody else and I just, I presented what had happened. And and it was like, yeah, you know, that was, that was probably a little bit of, uh, you know, inappropriate Mm -hmm. for for that conversation. And then I walked right back over to that person. I said, Hey, listen, I, you know, I want to apologize for what I said there, you know, and, and he acknowledged that it, that it was, you know, somewhat off-putting what I had said in terms of, you know, the situation. And then, but he said, thank you. And then we moved on. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it took. I used to confuse the, what people are looking for, because I, I do think there's, there's something to be said for people look to their leader to get them through a hard time or to get through the hard decisions. But what I was confusing is it's not that they're looking for me to always have the answer. They're looking for me to say, I don't know, or I made a mistake, but here's what we're going to do. I have a plan to move us forward. I think that they do look to us as leaders for that. Do you agree with that? Or what are your thoughts there? Yeah. And I would take it one step further. And I would say that, I believe in you to help us get through this. Yes. That as a team, we're going to figure yeah. this out. We're going yeah. to get through this. Well, said. I believe in you. I, mm-hmm. and, and that, that is I write about optimism in chapter one. Uh, and it's, I have four traits of what I think, you know, the four most important traits of a leader, one of which is optimism. And, you know, to, if you don't believe as the leader, no one will. And so a big part of, of leading is making sure that everyone understands that you believe in what's going on. You believe in them. You believe in your strategy. You believe in what you're doing. And so to me, that's the, that's the critical piece of uh, giving, them incur- uh, giving them strength, right, is your belief in what the team is doing and where you're going. Yeah. Love that. Thanks for sharing that. And that that's a lot of what you cover. I think it's in the one of the first chapters, due diligence on you is the name of that chapter. What else did we, have we not talked about that that comes to mind that is another one of those skills or strategies or behaviors that we need to develop or tap into as entrepreneurs to make this transition to this to becoming an effective leader? What, what else stands out to you that we haven't talked about already? Well, I mean, we've, we've covered a lot of it, you know, we really have. And, and so it's a great interview. Um, you know, I think that the, what, what it comes down to at the end of the day is believing as the leader that your team is powerful and that they can lead. And, you know, that, that is a transition that is very difficult for so many of us to be able to make. You know, I think that um, and then, and then also though, being committed to growth. And I think that that's the, you know, if there's a simple fundamental of this book, it is that, 
that you need to grow as a leader. And then, by the way, communicate that to your people mm. and communicate what you're working on, communicate the areas of growth that you're focused on, and then enlist them to support you in that growth. I see. Yeah. Because then they will do the same thing. Right. That's part of that vulnerability. That's part of uh, being a leader and showing what it is that you're you're working towards. Um, th this whole concept of, of committing to growth, is that part of what I think you dive into in the chapter on the power of learning and new perspectives? I'm assuming it's related to that. Is that true? Yeah, that's it. You know, that, I mean, that's a big part of it is, is you always need to be learning and growing. And I write a whole chapter on reading. And, you know, the fact that, you know, I hear people, I'll hear leaders say, I don't, you know, I don't have time to read or, <laughs> you know, we, we get all of our information in 30 second to two minute mm -hmm. snippets, you know, and, and, you know, we need to be doing deep dives. Um, I'm in the middle of a, of a great book right now by a woman at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And, you know, it's about um, resilience and, you know, it's a, bit of a hard read, but I'm telling you, it is a really, really powerful, powerful book. And what's the title and, of that one? Oh my gosh. I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> That's okay. I, I wasn't sure uh, it was the other one you had mentioned before we started recording. No, no, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, it's over on my desk. No uh, worries. We'll, we'll get anyway, that from so, you. But, but my point is, is that, that we all have to be constantly learning and, and doing deep dives, not not just skimming the surface. You know, I, I write in the book about how you'll hear somebody say, well, I read the first couple of chapters and I got it. It's like, mm. no way, <laughs> no way. Yeah. Like Authors leave the most powerful stuff at the end of the book, you know, like, like you got to read the whole thing. And so I, I am a huge advocate of just learning and, and, and spending time growing and, you know, it's everything. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Let's just stay on that point. Book recommendations, uh, other than the one that, that we've been talking about, your book, which again is entitled Grow, Take Your Business from Chaos to Calm. You had mentioned biographies and how powerful you think it is for us as entrepreneurs to read biographies. So, so tell me about that and the one you're currently or that you recommended to me before we started recording. Just generally the biography you know, here you have the the greatest, most powerful people uh, in history writing their biographies. And they're writing down the greatest lessons they learned and telling the stories. And why why we wouldn't tap that, I, I have no idea, you know. And so I've always loved reading biographies. And I just, I read Willie Nelson's biography just recently. And, it, you know, maybe a little bit of a weird biography to read as a business leader. But I'll tell you what, you read you read that gentleman's story, and there is a lot of lessons uh, that Willie Nelson brings to the table in terms of success and fortitude and sticking to it and mm -hmm. always trying to get better and, you know, and so on. And so, yeah, Willie Nelson's biography, um, Nelson Mandela, what, a, what an amazing story to read. And so, you know, the biography um, as a, you know, as a genre to me is the most powerful genre there is. And why wouldn't we be reading these stories? So, so that's one piece. And then you'd, you'd ask for it. And I said, you know, your brain at work is such an amazing book for leaders to read and understand because it, it talks about a lot of the neuroscience and the things that are occurring for you physically and occurring for your people physically when they're in moments of conflict or when they're in meetings or when they're and so, you know, that book to me is, is, uh, is worth its weight in gold. I think it's a guy by the name. Of, I think it's David Rock. I don't have it in front of me, but something Rock uh, is his last name. So your brain at work is just a super powerful book. Excellent. Thanks for those recommendations. And I'll have links to both of those as well as, of course, Mike's books on the show notes page of this episode at thehowofbusiness.com. And yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on biographies. I also think as we were chatting previously that when it relates to the creative process, even like with Willie Nelson, I'm sure he shares a little bit about his creative process there, not just his journey, but I think there's so much to learn there, Mike, about how others, how artists of different types go about the creative process. Because I think that when we build a business, it is a creative expression. Ultimately, a, the, ultimately a creative expression. I agree a hundred percent. And, and so how do these creative geniuses go about their work? You know, and I, I just, 
<laughs> I just can't, I can't say enough about how yeah. important it is to engage that. Agreed. All right. Where, where should we go to learn more about what you're doing these days and uh, about the book? Well, I just launched a website, uh, Michael J And, you know, talks a lot about my story in there. Um, I've got a classroom section uh, in there where I'm, you know, hopefully bringing a fair amount of reasonable or, or good content to people. And then, you know, you can attach to my, my social media channels through that. And, you know, that's where I'm posting content daily uh, around, you know, my opinions and the things that I have going on. And so michaeljmcfall.com is, is, is the place to connect with me. Excellent. We'll have links to that as well on the show notes page. If you're not where you can write that down. Uh, one last question I want to ask you related to the book. One of the final chapters is entitled Organizations of Tomorrow. So just give us a, a sneak peek. What, what what are you sharing there? What What's one item that you could share about what you're seeing and uh, are projecting are part of the organizations of tomorrow? I go deep into innovation there. I, you know, I go, I go deep into, um, you know, DEI uh, and the, the importance of, of diverse opinions and diverse experiences, you know, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, uh, the organization of tomorrow, you know, we're going to look back in 20 or 30 years and, and the companies that are thriving in 20 to 30 years are the companies that are going to make a really powerful investment in people and becoming human centric and making sure that their organizations are organizations that are built to help and expect their people to thrive, not only as employees, but as human beings. And at the end of the day, that's what, that's what people are going to expect of leadership and of their organizations. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing it already today, right? These, the organizations that are doing that, like your company, like Big B Coffee, are attracting and retaining the better talent already. Isn't that fair? Yeah, that's, and that is, you know, what I hope for at the end of the day is that people have the opportunity to self-select into organizations that are healthy, that are nurturing, that are supportive. And the, the organizations that aren't those things, people will have the ability to not select to go work there. Right. Excellent. All right, let's wrap it up, Mike. What's, what's one thing you want us to take away on this topic again of making this transition as the book grow talks about from a chaotic environment, from that bootstrapping environment to becoming a leader and, and growing our business to the point where we're no longer the key component where we can become irrelevant. What, what's one key thing you want us to take away on that topic? Well, if you can make that transition and if you can see it through uh, and commit to it, that calm, is a beautiful place to live as an entrepreneur. Calm is a place where you can engage your business and your life exactly how you want to. And you are, uh, at that point, in my opinion, you have the freedom that we all aspire to when we started the business originally. Well said. Couldn't agree with you more. Then the calm is where we find what it was that we made the investment of time and effort and money to get to, right? That That's the reward that we were working towards. It should be anyway. That's yeah, where we have, find it. Yeah. You have the, you have resources, uh, you have time, you, ha you know, that's what, to me, that's what all this is about. Exactly. All right. Tell us again, uh, the website you want us to go to, to learn more. Michael J McFall.com. Michael, another great uh, and insightful and actionable conversation. I'm glad I was able to get you back on the show. Thanks again for being with me again and for sharing your knowledge today. Thanks, Henry. It's a great interview. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. This is Henry Lopez, and thanks for joining me on this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Micah McFall. I release new episodes every Monday morning, and you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts, including at my website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.